Ah, the smooth, easy listening music from EA in 1991. Reminds me of the NHL hockey tune from the 91 season game. But this ain't hockey, this is a peaceful sport. This is Road Rash for the Sega Genesis. Actually, this is Road Rash for the Sega Mega Drive. Because this is the Japanese version. Lady, I don't know what you said, but you look like a Picasso painting that someone threw up on. That's really quite an insult. Fortunately, you can turn off the music in this game. Because after spending time with Genesis classics like Musha and Gary's with beautiful, smooth, flowing, electronic style music with deep bass and rich dynamics, this, this is like somebody stabbing your ear with a cheese grater on fire. Every time I sit down to play Road Rash 2 or Road Rash, I'm reminded of how good this series is, and constantly surprised that it's not a popular mainstream franchise title today. Even though it may look a bit jerky and chunky compared to today's smooth modern racing games, Road Rash, unlike many old school driving games, is still completely playable, exciting, and fun today. And I love this game, it's a beautiful mixture of a motorcycle racing game combined with a Mad Max style futuristic brutal sport. It's like rollerball with motorcycles. It's that good. Now the game may or may not be better with the music turned off, let's be honest here, the sound in Road Rash is not its strongest feature. The gameplay is, because the gameplay is just terrific. And while there have been sequels to Road Rash, I've previously reviewed Road Rash 2 and the series kept on going for a while, I feel like these games should have the same modern name recognition as EA's Madden series. And they should come out every year with a new Road Rash, with new tracks. And clearly add features like the ability to drag people behind your bike with chains. Anyway, if you have not played a Road Rash game, I'll quickly explain the concept. You're racing along a stretch of highway competing against a set number of bikes, which you attempt to pass using speed and or brutality. It helps to knock them off their bikes because that sends them further behind you, securing your lead. You can punch, you can kick, and occasionally swipe weapons from other drivers. As the game progresses, the tracks become longer and there's more obstacles. So no matter how well you drive, there's an element of surprise and road rash that's missing from most other driving games. You earn money as you race and can buy new faster motorcycles, which you'll definitely need to compete in the harder races. The beauty of Road Rash is that it's a game that keeps you on your toes because you can't just memorize tracks. It's extremely easy to slip up, crash into something, get hit by a car, or knocked off your bike by another rider, completely ruining your game. I wonder what she's saying. As you win races and play your way through the game, you then unlock longer, more difficult tracks. She's kind of psycho. Frequently you'll lose races and you collect change along the way, which you then use to buy motorcycles and drive faster and try again, combined with relatively smooth, playable 16-bit driving gameplay. The Road Rash games are some of the best driving slash combat games on the Genesis. They have a high degree of replayability, and as you saw from the beginning of the review, this game has a password system. Get ready to write down 50 character passwords though, and it's the kind that use O's, zeros, ones, and I's. I've previously reviewed Road Rash 2, which is, well, nearly identical to Road Rash 1. I'm not sure what's surprising, that Road Rash 1 is as good as Road Rash 2, or that they didn't really improve the game all that much for Road Rash 2. They added new tracks, the menus are better, and the password system is a lot shorter, and I think there's more bikes. 
It has those cutscenes, and I want to say it's slightly more refined than this one, but it's really not. It's pretty much more of the same, which is fine by me, because as far as I'm concerned, they hit perfection with this game, and more of the same is cool. You can't go wrong with more tracks. The good news for Genesis and or Mega Drive owners these days is that you can find Road Rash 1 and 2 easily, and they're affordable. If it makes any difference, the Japanese version of Road Rash works on an American Sega Genesis, which is how I'm playing this. This game was generously donated to Classic Game Room by Mohammed in Qatar. Thank you again, and just think how well-traveled this game is. It's from Japan, it's been to Qatar, the US, and now Alfar, the aquatic laboratory for awesome reviews. Somewhere beneath the sea. It's Road Rash. It's one of the best games on the Genesis, which makes it one of the best games ever made. Any game that has excellent driving controls where you can punch people off their bikes and then run over them. Gets the classic game room seal of approval. Star Wars Arcade, the 1994 showpiece, demonstrating the power of the Sega 32X add-on for the Sega Genesis, which uses the power of the Force, five AC adapters, three hydro spanners, 12 wires, and lots of blinky lights and switches that do nothing to increase the power of the Sega Genesis to near-death star level. If the Sega Genesis is the ATST of video game consoles, the 32X is the AT AT. Just, uh, just make sure to step on any Jedi's before they start uh, attacking you with a lightsaber. It's always a weak point. Well, as impressive as Luke Skywalker is with a lightsaber, he's even more impressive piloting his X-Wing fighter. An experience that this game succeeds in giving you. And what's impressive, I mean most impressive about this game, is that it's still fun and playable today. Wipe out enemy fighters. Yes, sir! Admiral Akbar is the man, well, man creature thing. He had a great action figure, too. Hey, Star Destroyers! Let's attack them head on! It's our only hope! You know, if you just if you just hang out behind one of those things, they'll eventually dump their trash before they go into hyperspace and you just float away. Just make sure nobody's following you. Ah, it never gets old. Let's get back to the gameplay. Most of the early 3D styled games are slow, cumbersome, and sorely outdated, but not Star Wars Arcade. This is a kick-ass game, period. And another fine example of the power of the 32X, because it does a terrific job bringing this, this, this size of a game onto the Sega Genesis, which was really designed for 2D games. But here we are, flying through space, fighting Star Destroyers and TIE Fighters. R2, no! Curse the Empire for taking out their aggression on Kenny Baker. They are the most incompetent empire ever. They couldn't even defeat the Ewoks. It's no wonder the Rebels won. So, as you can probably tell, what you're doing in this game is flying around, shooting spaceships and eventually ground targets on the Death Star. You don't have full control of the X-Wing fighter, though. You can't just fly wherever you want. You're definitely confined. And because of that, believe it or not, this is not the best 
spaceship action game on the 32X. Shadow Squadron outdoes Star Wars Arcade, but this game has better style. Terrific music and sound effects, and the visuals are very nice as well. I think they look good today. You can actually tell what things are, which uh, says a lot for an early 3D style game. I'm going to use a Star Wars name as an adjective to describe this. Star Wars Arcade is Lando. Look, s balls in attack position. Three leaders standing by. They're coming in. Three marks at 210. Watch it, you've got one on your tail. We should be using that term, like, how was your weekend? My weekend was Lando. Whoa, you must have had a great weekend. Because, because you know Lando had fun on his weekends. He probably had a Star Wars arcade machine in Cloud City. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the remaining number of targets of enemy fighters that you have to destroy. My only gripe with this game is that you don't have full 3D control. And sometimes it feels like you're just waiting for one of the enemies to fly in front of you so that you can shoot them. It's like, uh, it's like Top Gun, or Air Raiders, or even Afterburner. It's like a 3D-styled, 2D-style, replicating 3D-style flight game. This is no F-15 Strike Eagle. Or F-19 Stealth Fighter. You don't have full control of your spaceship in a real three-dimensional environment, even though it kind of seems like you do. You can turn around, you can face the other direction, but it's, it's only like half there. That's where Shadow Squadron com comes out ahead in terms of gameplay. But Star Wars Arcade kicks its ass in terms of style, because this game is so Lando. Now it's not just X-Wing fighters here, you can also fly a Y-Wing in a two-player game, so that one person is flying and shooting like this, and another person is the gunner for some additional firepower moving another cursor around the screen shooting bad guys. Really sweet game. For those of you with a Sega 32X or those of you eyeing one up, Star Wars Arcade is extremely easy to find and affordable. This copy was donated by Frank in California. Thank you. And Frank also donated Virtua Fighter for the 32X. I recorded a thank you, but then I realized th that I actually cut it out afterwards in editing. That was such a Jar Jar move. May the force be with you, Frank. I hope you're having a Lando weekend. Okay, here's where I crash my multi-billion dollar X-Wing and lose the game. But no matter how poorly you fly, we're all winners when we play Star Wars Arcade on the 32X. feeling about it. Something's not right. You get scared at the first signs of trouble. Good. Oh, boy. Oh, no! AD. It is a time when Earth's technology enables mankind to send spaceships on missions to other planets. That's incredible. Nothing I say can top that. It's Black Hole Assault. This is Space Station DEFCON 2, calling Explorer 627. Come in. And how can headquarters see these as accidents when they're obviously alien attacks? And damn it, we don't have insurance against alien attacks, so we're going to find those aliens in the most dramatic way possible, and then kick them right in the shins over and over again until it really hurts. Provoke hostilities to continue unchallenged. May courage and strength be with you.
You know, I love any game where they spent 97% of the time making it on the cutscenes, because this is clearly a labor of love surrounding a lousy fighting game. And you gotta respect that. After the ultra-dramatic intro sequence with questionable acting but good editing, they clearly had a limited budget, this quickly devolves into one of the lousiest fighting games on the Sega CD, which means it's an absolute must-have. And yes, I'm still suffering from a cold, everyone, so I'm gonna talk like the guy in the cutscenes. It's an alien attack! They're out of touch! I'm certain that these losses in communication are due to alien attacks! Before each mission, you choose one of two robots that jump and kick and punch and occasionally shoot things. Then you battle aliens, who eventually explode. And then you move on to the next level, and do it again. It's a terrible fighting game, but this feels like it was somebody's opportunity to finally make a science fiction movie, and they just had to attach a video game to it. That's what I like about Black Hole Assault. It's got a lot of passion. And did we really need another good fighting game in 1992? No. I'll take all the bad ones I can get. Especially when I believe that the director has seen Alien as many times as I have. Also, let me compliment the audio mixing and the terrific sound effects. There's a lot of layers in here. Through most of this review, I'm playing the storyline of Black Hole Assault, where you choose one of the two human-controlled robots and battle all of the aliens. As you fight your way through the solar system, in different environments that have realistic gravity. Lethal enemy liberators have been decimated. Cam's ready to beam aboard. After every couple battles, you're rewarded with some kick-ass Sega CD cutscenes, and I'm pretty sure they didn't hire actors for this. As you can see this. from the preliminary reports, it's almost certain the enemy has established a supply base and command post near the planet Saturn. As you're well aware, our previous missions, we I choose to believe the developers and the production team did all the voices themselves for fun, because it sounds like they were having fun. It's obvious that our hover packs will play a key role in this battle. Request permission to attack. Captain, seek permission to attack. You idiot, just go! There's not a whole lot of difference between the two robots. I found that over time the red one was easier to use because he knees people in the face, which is a pretty a pretty good move that I just used over and over again. As a general rule, you don't want to get too close to the aliens or they grab you and kick your ass, so just keep your distance, shoot missiles or lasers at them, and then knee them or kick them in the face. Because that's how you fight an alien attack! This is a relatively early release for the Sega CD with a 1992 copyright from BigNet and Micronet that takes advantage of some of the unique features that the Sega CD offered in, in 1992 compared to, say, the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive. For one thing, there's a lot of voice dialogue, which is wonderful, quite a bit of animation, and some pretty good music. This base is guarded by a new offensive weapon codenamed Whiplash. Reports indicate that this new weapon shoots black holes at its opponent. You know what they say, if it fires black holes, it can't be all bad. Beyond the entertaining storyline, there's also an exhibition mode where you can just fight the computer as the aliens, or you can battle a friend in two-player. It's not a great game, but at the same time, it's a great game on the Sega CD. And comes highly recommended by Classic Game Room, of course. And this was sent to the show by Season of Pensacola, Florida, so... Here's a huge classic game room shout out and thank you going to season. Thank you for introducing me to Black Hole Assault. Love this one. I checked online, the packaging for this game looks amazing. Thankfully it's not all that expensive, it'll still run a couple bucks. But I think it's worth it if you're looking for a subpar fighting game with character on the Sega CD. So kids, put down your good fighting games and find out how much fun you can have playing a bad one. It's Black Hole Assault.
That has to be the best title screen of any video game ever made. This is Super Monaco GP for the Sega Genesis. And nothing makes you want to race faster than the allure of 16-bit beautiful women in bathing suits. And this is one of my favorite games of all time for the Sega Genesis. And one that I remember winning as a kid. And I was really good at this game. I played this game for months straight. And this is the video game that got me into driving games. Menu screen here, we have the arcade mode, the Super Monaco GP, the World Championship, free practice, and options, and three transmission options. Now it's up to you. The World Championship is the heart of this game. You start off with a team, Team Minare, and let's try hard to win. They're always very polite. And you can see the stats on your car. You start with a uh, fairly underpowered car and have to work your way up, beating rivals all the way along the world championship to uh, get better cars. You select a rival when you start out each game, and they give you a bunch of guys to choose from, from around the world. There's any number of these guys that you can choose, and if you beat them several times, I forget exactly how many times, I'll get to that in a bit, but if you beat them, you can get on their team and drive their car, and you see the car statistics are all a little bit different and generally better than the one that I'm starting out with. That's the uh, number one guy, Team Madonna. Team Zero Force is from West Germany, which dates this game a bit. Whenever you pick a rival, they give you a little statement. I decided to go up against a fellow Yank, and what does he tell me? It's interesting. I guess that's all he could come up with. I've been wanting to review Super Monaco GP since 1999 when we started the classic game room video game review show. And I finally got my chance, I sat down for a weekend, played this game, and to my shock and horror, I was a hell of a lot better at this game when I was about 14 years old than I am now. In fact, I did so poorly when I started playing that they booted me off the team. Those sons of bitches kicked me off their racing team. And I joined Team Comet. Well, let's enjoy the race together. What they're really saying is you're so bad we're f***ed anyway. Our original driver OD'd on cocaine at a nightclub. I'll pick Team Rigel as my Rival, let's drive fair. They're from Finland. This is when I was just getting back into the game and I figured if I couldn't beat this guy, I'd at least try to run his car off the road. When you collide with your opponents, smoke starts coming out the back of their car and they go behind you. So it's actually a nice way to get rid of someone in front of you. As we learned in Days of Thunder, Rubbin's racing, so I guess it's all legit. But in all seriousness, Super Monaco GP is an incredible game. And this is one of the first games I can think of that has the amount of courses. This has 16 different courses, many of which uh, are, are going to be very familiar to those of us who play racing games today. And I know that a number of them, maybe all of them for all I know, are based on real world tracks. You can do a free practice mode. This is the track from Japan, which I believe is the Suzuka track. And this is Monaco, which is uh, Cote de Jure in Gran Turismo 4. When you come out of the tunnel, it has that hairpin. And the nice lady changes into a white bathing suit when she tells you what track it is that you're racing on. And this is the USA track. 
this is where I started actually remembering how to play this game and uh, getting back to where I used to be. I'm still nowhere close to as good as I used to be. It took me a little while to get back into this game because I was originally playing it as if I was playing Forza 2 or, or Gran Turismo. And it's not a driving simulator, it's an arcade game. So you have to play it like it's an arcade game. And also driving F1 cars is very different than driving uh, regular cars. Not that I've actually driven an F1 car, but at least in my knowledge of video games. So instead of doing uh, some smooth braking while you're coming into a turn and then feeling how your car's handling while you're braking, you just turn really hard and really fast and uh, you eventually get the hang of it. Pick a new rival because I need a new car. I'm going to go up against Team May from Great Britain. Now let's compete against each other. Now for each race you qualify, and I'm doing terrible in my qualifications, so that's why I'm always starting near the back of the pack. And you'll notice all the cars look the same, except for the one that's your rival. And it also shows you where he is on the, on the little track graph to your right. This game was really advanced when it came out, and this just blew away games like Pole Position 2. You can even pit if your car gets damaged. Now it's up to you. This is the Great Britain track, one of the ones I was really getting into. And notice out in the distance we have some helicopters out on a landing pad. Or on the runway or something. You run five laps in the World Championship. Gives you your lap times on the top right. I'm kind of sad to say I didn't have the time to get back into this game to be as good as I was uh, practically 20 years ago. This is the kind of game that I remember when I was a kid playing this, that I would hang off the edge of the seat with white knuckles gripping the Sega Genesis controller, obsessed with winning it. I memorized every track. I, 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 I progressed throughout the game, and I got into, the, got into the best car that I could get into. I can't remember which was my team exactly, but I remember having the last race on track 16, the Monaco track, and hitting every corner perfectly, cutting off the, uh, the other cars, and, and I, I won the game, and just was ecstatic about it you know it's that feeling of excitement that you can that you really only feel when you're when you're young sometimes when I play these games that I liked so much as a kid I'm uh, disappointed at how I look at them now but Super Monaco GP although definitely somewhat antiquated by today's standards in today's driving games like the Forza and Gran Turismo series this game is still really fun I just hit that son of the bitch in the back. He taunts me by saying, you can seldom win by sheer luck. That wasn't luck, I intentionally ran your fucking car off the road. If you grew up with the Sega Genesis, this game is probably already in your collection. And if you're into arcade-style racing games and classic games and haven't played this, then you certainly should.
Welcome to Classic Game Room. Do you like Predator and Die Hard as much as I do? Then you're going to love this. It's the ultimate testosterone fueled explosion fest. This is Surgical Strike on the Sega CD. Whenever Steven Spielberg makes a movie, inside, he cries a little bit. Because deep down he knows that nothing he ever does will hold a candle to Surgical Strike on the Sega CD. This is the single greatest cinematic creation ever released in any form of media ever. There's one person alive who likes 80s action movies more than me. This guy. These rebels must be stopped before they're killing and brutality. James Riley is a hero. The director of Surgical Strike and some other Sega CD games you may have heard of like Night Trap may have gone on to have a successful career as a visual effects supervisor on television shows that you've probably heard of, but really, after making this, isn't it all downhill? I am so tired of seeing your worthless butt up on charges that I'm not even going to bother with the formalities. Hang him. What a bonehead. This is amazing. How has it taken me this many years to play Surgical Strike? Admittedly, the game doesn't play nearly as well as it looks, but it looks phenomenal. Silos are closing, Colonel. Nice going, strike team. Way to go, guys. You okay? Good flying, soldier. Sure, the acting's terrible, but that's part of its charm. In all seriousness, though, the visual effects are spectacular. In the years before this stuff was easy to do with computers, Surgical Strike has a nice array of miniature tanks and buildings blowing up. So it's really no surprise that James Riley went on to be a visual effects supervisor because he's clearly really good at it. The music and atmosphere aren't too bad either, but like most of the Sega CD full motion video games, it doesn't play terribly well. It's, it's not one of the worst ones though. In fact, it's probably one of the better ones. You hop into your future stealth hovercraft, and your objective is to drive around this map blowing up a couple key targets. On your way, you have to shoot all of the enemies before they shoot you. You take damage easily. Your main control is the targeting reticule that you move around screen. You have to quickly target enemies and then either shoot them with your Gatling gun or missiles. And you have limited ammo. Which makes the game really challenging and eventually just turns it into a memorization exercise. Because once you figure out the best path through the map, you find that you just keep shooting the same enemies over and over again. And while that's thoroughly enjoyable... The game itself is a bit frustrating because you're just trying to lock onto things quickly with a slow moving cursor. Contrary to what the packaging claims, you don't have full control of your hovercraft. You hold down the C button on your Genesis controller and quickly react to the turning prompts when they show up on screen. Thankfully, you can pull up the map at any time with the start button. You have three lives for each mission, but no continues. And I think you'll find there's a lot of trial and error. So eventually, as good as the game looks, it does get tiresome. But you gotta love it. They just don't make games like this anymore. Okay, player, you got the play. Drop time on 400 hours. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I'm playing Assassin's Creed Syndicate right now, and sure, it looks amazing, but you know, I'd much rather watch cutscenes with bad actors in front of cardboard sets. What were you thinking out there? 90s full motion video cutscenes were the best because in the days before everyone took this stuff way too seriously, they just had fun making them. And the fun shows. Now I've got an explosion fest sized classic game room shout out and thank you to send to Sosa Games from Anderson, Indiana. Sosa Games. 
Go there and buy up every copy of Surgical Strike because it's awesome. They better have a sale on Truxton. And of course, I'd like to give a round of applause to everyone who worked on Surgical Strike. This game is an artistic masterpiece on the Sega CD. when you violate one of God's commandments, you burn like bacon in hell, boy. Welcome to Classic Game Room, coming to you from the Intergalactic Space Arcade. Are you ready for some fantasy action platforming brilliance? Well then hang on to something and prepare for this review. It's Alicia Dragoon on the Sega Genesis. I have one right here. Because why wouldn't you have a Sega Genesis right next to you? At all times. Prepare to embark on the fabulous fantasy adventure of a lifetime on your Sega Genesis with 1992's Alicia Dragoon from Game Arts and Gynax. Now, I'm not familiar with them, but Game Arts is one of my favorite game developers ever, responsible for such games as Gun Griffin, Sylphide, and the Almighty Thexter. In fact, I think this game could be described as a fantasy version of Thexter meets Golden Axe. It's good. Oh, it's really good. Wait till you see this. Alicia Dragoon is side-scrolling platforming goodness where you play as a babe who teams up with a group of four monsters. Like Thexter, she electrocutes enemies using auto-targeting lasers that she shoots out of her hands instead of her eyeballs. Unlike Thexter, she cannot transform into a jet, although they both look great in a metal bikini. What? Oh, you don't, you don't have the super secret artwork for Thexter? Oh, it's awesome. Uh, anyway, what you'll want to do in Alicia Dragoon is explore everything. There's hidden stuff everywhere. Power-ups that make Alicia and her monster friends more powerful, and you'll want all of them. Because after about level 6, this game gets pretty seriously hard. It's not that lengthy of a game, but it's thoroughly entertaining from start to finish with beautiful visuals, great music, and that fantasy Thexter-like style gameplay plus monsters. What a winning combination! Now, as you may have noticed, Alicia can't fire her lasers non-stop. You've got to give her time to recharge. And that can be pretty tough during some boss battles. Also, if you let them fully recharge, you get like a super laser beam which will clear off pretty much everything on screen. For the most part, another cool feature is that you can switch between your four monsters by hitting the A button. Each of them has a slightly different attack. Your dragon will shoot fireballs. You have some kind of an eagle that'll shock everything on screen, a lizard that throws boomerangs, and then a fireball. Most of the early levels are pretty easy, but the later levels each require their own strategy, especially the end bosses. And certain monsters are better for certain bad guys than others. For example, the fireball is pretty good for just floating around you, taking out smaller enemies. But the dragon is good if you're looking to firebomb larger ones that move slowly. Alicia Dragoon gets really tough when you start to encounter the bad guys who attack you before you even know they're there. She takes a lot of damage quickly.
At some point, you need to have the levels memorized and know when to be fully charged and what monster to use. This one was sent to the show by our good friend Ben from Buffalo, New York. Thank you once again for an excellent game, Ben. Alicia Dragoon is super. Highly recommended for your Sega Genesis or Sega Mega Drive. If you think it looks cool on screen, it is. Game Room broadcast from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room. You know a game has extra power when it's got the little yellow thing on the Sega Genesis cartridge. This is F-117 Nightstorm, a game where you're going to bomb a bunch of things using 16-bit power. But not before you give yourself a pilot name and a plane name complete with Avatar. Final verdict looks promising. Let's see what else they have. Perpetrator, uh, can't pronounce. Oh, Lazy Susan. Not too lazy to show that Susan's got back. I think we're gonna go with Final Verdict, though. Meet your F-117, a Nighthawk, the stealth which was first flown in 1981. So they're just going to hand it off to you, an inexperienced pilot. Have fun crashing it. Sad music. I love the sad music. You've made a crater. This is a most unfortunate occurrence. Yes, unfortunate. Sorry I've destroyed a billion dollars worth of airplane. Now give me another one so I can try to crash it too. Autopilot off. Mission accomplished. Keep talking. I totally have a crush on the 16-bit voice in the game. F-117 Nightstorm is an impressive 1993 Sega Genesis flight simulator. I'm making my own sound effects. Autopilot off. Target destroyed. I love the way she says autopilot. This reminds me of a game that I spent countless hours playing back in the day called F-19 Stealth Fighter on the PC. I've always enjoyed airplane games. I used to play the hell out of F-15 Strike Eagle too. So here's the thing with F-117 Nightstorm. Do not go into this game expecting Afterburner. It's more simulation, less arcade-style action. Even though there's some air combat, the F-117 was used primarily as a bomber. And according to the internet, they really didn't build very many of them. Probably because it didn't work really well. Why would you use one of these when you could use Airwolf? Autopilot off. Mission accomplished. I really like the heavy hitting music in this game. It has that Sega Genesis punchy sound quality to it. And it's very good. There's a campaign that you can fly through in F-117 Nightstorm, as well as a password system so that you can continue, and an arcade mode. Target destroyed. Autopilot engaged. Depending on what mission you're playing and who you're attacking, there's a variety of weapons. But I never got used to the manual bombing. I, I enjoyed the ones that you actually fly in with a camera. Those are fun. Let's go to the arcade mode where you equip your airplane and then decide how many enemies you're going to destroy in a certain time limit for points. It doesn't sound like they spent a whole lot of time on sound effects, but the voice recording is very good. And extremely seductive. 
While this isn't the most playable game, it's definitely jerky and feels like it's pushing the limits of what the Sega Genesis is capable of. It's an impressive technical release. And reminds me of one of the old late 80s, early 90s flight sim PC games. But wait, there's more. The Sega Genesis is known for its excellent 2D games. Well, F117 shows that it was capable of delivering some old school 3D style games with multiple camera angles, as demonstrated here by the missile cam. But what's most impressive is the chase cam and then a lot of the other camera perspectives that allowed you to basically fly around your airplane like a modern 3D action game. Why? It's going to impact on the surface. No need for concern. Now it's nearly impossible to fly the airplane like this, but it looks really neat. And this would have been just amazing back in the day. I've really enjoyed playing this. It's a blast from the past. That, that reminds me of old school PC flight sims, but it's not the most playable game by today's standards. But I'll give the developers a lot of credit for making an impressive game on the 16-bit Genesis, which was really not designed to play games like this. Target destroyed. That was a great sequence there, and I like that sound. It's pretty neat. So this is F-117 Night Storm if you're looking for some old school Sega Genesis air combat that plays more like a PC game, then check this one out. F-117. Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I'm celebrating robots, mechs, and cyborgs all month, starting with Eastwatch, City Under Siege for the Sega Genesis. Sega. From way back in 1990, the dawn of the cyberpunk era, this is Eastwatch, City Under Siege for the Sega Genesis which was originally called Cyber Police City Under Siege in Japan. Let's kick off Mecha March Madness Month what? with a month full of robots, mechs, and cyborgs starting with this incredibly average side-scrolling platformer on your Mega Drive or Sega Genesis. E-SWAT. I remember this game when it was new. And I'll be honest, I was disappointed in 1990 or 91, whatever year I played it, because it had no relation to my favorite manga at the time, Appleseed, which features E-SWAT. But this is a different E-SWAT, no Dunin or Briarios to be found. In E-SWAT City Under Siege, you're like a poor man's Robocop. In fact, you don't even get your cyborg robot armor until the third level. Until then, you're a traffic cop in tan slacks. He's got nice boots, though. I remember renting this game when it was new, and my opinion really hasn't changed much. It's like a glorified NES side-scroller. Games like this were the first-person shooters of 1990. We were drowning in them. Some of them were amazing, like The Revenge of Shinobi. Others were downright awful. And then there's E-SWAT, which is right in the middle. It has its moments. It's not terrible, it's just... It, it feels like an early Sega Genesis game. It's kind of slow, it plods along, it's got a nice style, but not much imagination in the gameplay department. It doesn't even start to get interesting until level 3. 
when you finally get your cyborg armor. Murphy, it's you! No, it's not. It's this other guy. You know he's still got his cool boots underneath that armor though, right? Finally, we live up to the title of the game. There's a bigger health bar and jetpacks. If you can make it through the boredom and mediocrity of the first two levels, you can start to enjoy the game. But don't expect anything that hasn't been done better before. Sure, you'll pick up some new weapons, and one of them is a flamethrower. Never a bad thing. As you can tell, I'm not a huge fan of this one, but it's not to say that you shouldn't give it a try. It's actually really cheap and easy to find. This one is also on the Virtual Console and in Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection. Mission completed. Good drum roll there. The music's not too bad, and I like the visual style and color palette. It's definitely got that early 90s cyberpunk thing going on. But it fails to really do anything terribly exciting with the gameplay. By level 5, I think, you start flying around more and avoiding death traps and stuff. And, that, and that's actually really tricky. I ended up just getting frustrated at that point in the game. The boss battles aren't terribly exciting, and the, the fact is there's way better side-scrollers on the Genesis. But this one might cost you at least a dollar. Assuming you don't already have this in your Sonic's Ultimate Genesis collection, because you should. The question is, should you spend your time playing this, or The Revenge of Shinobi? You know the answer. Which game does it better? Yeah, that one. But there's something to be said for mastering the flying controls in ESWAT. It feels somewhat broken. So if you're looking for a challenge, here you go. You've got to ask yourself, how many games have a death escalator? Maybe I need that in my life. It's like a Stairmaster from hell. And even less exciting. You know what? I'm gonna name that thing. I dub the Death Escalator the Death Escalator. Revenge of Shinobi does not have a Death Escalator, and neither does Macy's. At least it's got the generic side scrolling black and yellow factory flooring. That's always a good thing. And I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you to send to Terrell from. Kings Tree, South Carolina, again. Thank you, T. Thank you for eSWAT. This one's not for me, I've, I've been emotionally scarred by it, but if you're looking for a serious challenge, especially in the flying sequences, eSWAT is there for you and it's really affordable. Could have used more Dunin though. And those giant spider things that destroyed Olympus and chicks with fox ears and tails and stuff. Actually, you probably could have done without those, but definitely the spider things. ESWAT! City under siege. It may not have burning people with monsters and cutting them in half a toot, but it does have the Death Escalator! It's got a catchy beat, it's got Mario Lemieux, it's on the Sega Genesis. But is it any good? It's Mario Lemieux Hockey from 1991. And what is he holding over his head? Is that supposed to be the Stanley Cup? It looks like the Goblet of Fire. Mario Lemieux and the Goblet of Fire, that's got a nice ring to it. Anyway, let's start a game. And I'll pick the Pittsburgh Pay- whoa, hey. Oh, this game doesn't have the NHL license. Aha. As Mr. Bob Smith says, this game is from Sega. Thanks, Bob. That should have been Bob Airy. And the game that we're watching is Pittsburgh's um, team versus the Washington other people. And uh, these are the, the only two teams in this entire game that actually have uniforms that kind of look like their respective NHL teams. The colors in this game are actually quite amusing, but uh, obviously, I'm playing as Pittsburgh, since I'm from Pittsburgh, and the other team is the Washington... Ca they're 
the other team. It's like the Winter Classic, but not really. As a Genesis fan and a Penguins fan back in 91 and 92 when we were winning Stanley Cups, I remember this game thinking it was really cool that Mario Lemieux had his own hockey game. But never really liked it because it wasn't as good as NHL hockey from EA, which it's not. It does have some really awesome fighting though, a bunch of Mario clones with mullets beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> ah. And a quick fact for those of you who do not live in Pittsburgh, Mario Lemieux is one of the owners of the Pittsburgh Penguins today. We get to see him on TV during pretty much every game drinking a giant glass of wine, so cheers to you Mario. Although that's beer. Now would somebody please score in this game? Yeah, all right, Mario Lemieux scored. Was that Mario? Aren't, are they all Mario? Or was that Jay Coffee? It doesn't matter because I'm rooting for P Pittsburgh. The fact is that this game does not deserve the name Mario Lemieux. The savior of the Penguins, the man that kept them in town, deserves a better game than this. Because Mario Lemieux hockey is like Sega's attempt to recreate Konami's Blades of Steel. But they failed because this game does not have Gradius during the intermissions. It also doesn't really play all that well. It looks good and it sounds good. And it says Sega Genesis on the ice. That's pretty awesome. I'd much rather have that than the console energy center. But it's kind of sloppy. Scoring is completely based on just throwing the puck at the net and hoping it goes in. Passing is useless and changing players is pretty much impossible. Also, the AI in this game is some of the worst AI I've ever seen in any game. You see, this game should be called Wayne Gretzky Hockey. Not that I have anything against Wayne Gretzky. In fact, he's on my team, the Moose Jaw Sorcerers, with Lord Carnage. He's the fourth line center. But Mario is on the first line. Please reference my review of NHL 12 from EA Sports. And I think there's a reason that we're still playing EA Sports produced NHL games today and not Mario Lemieux Hockey. But again, I love the colors in this game. Nothing says Chicago like, what is that, aqua and purple. Definitely not the Blackhawks. It's like they tried to get a bit fancy with this game. It's, it calls random penalties. The face-offs get old quickly. And when your goalie has the puck, uh, he just throws it right to the opposing team. But wait, there's more. You also get a shootout mode, which plays like this. There's also a fighting mode in the game, but no fatalities. Detroit's in pink, Vancouver is in yellow and uh, green. If you're a hockey fan and eyeing up collectible Sega Genesis games, this one would not be too bad to pick up because it's cheap and if you have some friends it would be fun to play with another human being because then you would have the same controls. But just don't play Boston versus Buffalo because you can't tell the two teams apart. So a big thanks to our friend Sergio Mateus from Polinia, Brazil for donating this game to the show. It's been a long time since I've played it. And I think I've got a great spot for it right next to my 1991 Stanley Cup Championship beer mug when I'm not using it. These days, retro remakes and reboots of old school franchises are nothing new, but back in 1994, it was quite a thing. To see a new version of the Atari 2600 classic, Pitfall. 
This is Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, where you play as Pitfall Harry's son, who's off to save his dad who was just kidnapped in the previous cutscene, in case you missed it. So, for starters, unlike a lot of newer retro remakes, this doesn't feel like Solus Dribble trying to cash in on an old franchise. It's quite good, and extremely imaginative. We're watching the Sega Genesis version, which I had back in the day, or at least I rented it, and I loved this game. As a fan of the original Pitfall, I liked what they did with this game, and I still do. They creatively capture many of the old school elements, like the pits that open and close, hopping on uh, crocodiles, or, or alligators, whatever they are. And of course, swinging from vines. As if the environments aren't colorful and detailed enough, the designers used some unique tricks to add additional depth to the game, like the split-level designs, where you play through on the front level and then have to end up climbing things in the background. The levels themselves are gigantic, and obviously they're nice to look at, but they're filled with things to collect for points, and you'll see rings and bars of gold laying around that you're just not sure how to get the first couple times you play through the game. I like that it retains an old-school style scoring system, so rather than collecting for the sake of collecting, you're collecting for a score, which makes it worthwhile. Also, some additional weapons are useful during boss battles, and if you look hard enough, you'll find them laying around, too. You'll find throwing stones, boomerangs, and exploding stones. You'll want as many of them as you can find because you're always outgunned in this game. When you get down to it, this is not a combat-focused, side-scrolling, platforming action game. Like the original Pitfall, it's more about jumping and timing. But when they throw in things like boss battles and lots of tricky enemies that are hard to hit with your limited array of weaponry, you'll frequently hope to find a stash of machine guns left over somewhere. I would say that the main character feels a bit weighted down by the additional detail and animation. I love that his coat moves and flows with him when he jumps, but that's also what makes this game Pitfall. It's just not a run-and-gun style shooter. Nor is it a Mario game where you jump on enemies' heads. You just have to avoid them, but you can take a lot of damage. I like the detail on those swinging fire things. While Pitfall the Mind Adventure is a good action-adventure platformer, it's a great visual experience and an amazing technical achievement that just blew me away back in the 90s and showed how far games had come from the original Pitfall and even to remind you they include a version of the original Pitfall. Not surprisingly, I actually prefer the original Pitfall. It's a brilliant game, and the one I grew up with. My favorite Pitfall is actually Pitfall 2, The Lost Caverns for Atari 2600. Watch my review of that game and see how awesome it is, but this game is pretty impressive, too. Which is an understatement. Actually, this game is extremely impressive and a lot of fun. There's just so much to explore, it's incredibly challenging. And the good news is, it's also cheap and easy to find. At least for the Sega Genesis, this is also available on the Nintendo Virtual Console. It's Pitfall The Mayan Adventure. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I got dressed today before I realized I was reviewing a Sega Genesis game. This is Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing for the Sega Genesis. Box. 
Here's the real deal. Mike Tyson was a good boxer and got his own video game. Then James Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson and got his video game. And then Evander Holyfield knocked out James Buster Douglas and got this video game. Which is better than Buster Douglas's, but not as good as Mike Tyson's. And nowhere near as good as Samurai Showdown. This 1992 release for the Sega Genesis isn't too bad as far as boxing games go. It's got some nice features, like create your own boxers, which is racist, because you can't make green people. Here's my championship boxer, Zaxxon, no relation to the video game, who's punching Wild Man West in the face until he falls down and supplies me with upgrades to become more powerful and fight the next boxer. After I knock him out, I'm going to hit the gym and get cyborg fists installed and adamantium claws. Pick three items. I don't see adamantium claws. How about a week-long vacation at a super spa with the chick from Super Monaco GP? The crowd agrees because you need something to fight for. A 16-bit hottie Sega Genesis superiority Evander Holyfield's smooth mustache. Choose something that's close to your heart and beat the crap out of anyone that gets in your way. The Genesis does what Nintendo don't. It has real deal boxing. A very straightforward game. You can punch high, you can punch low, throw a left hook, a right hook. It even has blood. Look closely now that Zaxxon is getting his ass kicked by Hot Rod Nils. There's not a whole lot to this game, to be honest. You're basically just leveling your character up, making them faster and stronger the more that you play. You make your way through all of these other real-world 16-bit fighters, earn cash that you spend frivolously and invest foolishly, and then eventually get washed out and erased. Unhappy with Zaxxon's performance, but very happy with her performance. She's doing a great job holding up that number three. I decided to make a new fighter named Van Dam, who's about to beat Tom Jolly into a bloody pulp. If he would ever stop running away from me. The other fighters in this game are cowards. Let's let's just skip past all of them and go straight to Evander Holyfield. Or not, how about more training and possible cybernetic enhancements? I want flamethrowers and invisibility. Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing also has a two-player mode, so you and your friends can both create characters and fight until they have 16-bit brain damage. Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing. It's not a great game, but it's a hell of a lot better than that James Buster Douglas boxing game on the Genesis. This was sent to the show by our good friend Mohammed from Qatar. So thank you, Mohammed, once again. We all know that Sega Genesis is the real deal, and Evander Holyfield was lucky to be invited to the party. He does have a great mustache, though. You gotta give him credit for that. Up, down, left, right, A, B, start, select, shoots fireball. There's no select button on the Genesis controller, is there? Damn it, no wonder I can't pull that trick off. Thanks again, Mohammed. It's Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing. I wonder if I'll sign my Genesis game cartridge.
Welcome to Classic Game Room, coming to you from the Intergalactic Space Arcade, powered by the Magic El Camino and the Disco Ball of Power, working to bring the review of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for Sega Genesis. Sonic the Hedgehog returns for his second adventure in 1992's Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Sega Genesis, where we get to meet a new friend, Miles Tails Prowler. Miles Prowler. Get it? Miles Prowler? Huh? Clever. And he has two tails. Good old school traditional 2D Sonic gameplay returns. This game is actually very similar to the first one, except I've left Tails miles behind in this shot. You can play one or two player. In single player, he just kind of tags along. In two player, you can play with a friend, split screen, and compete for points. Another major feature here is that you can play as Tails from the options menu at the start screen. Choose Sonic, Tails, or both. Collect 50 rings in a level and jump into one of those little stargates and go for a Chaos Emerald if you're serious about your points. You'll hear me rave about the music through the entire review, but this is my favorite song in the game. It's great. And notice how smoothly it runs, too. I think that combined with tails, combined with larger levels to explore, makes this an improvement over the excellent first game. Now, if you're watching a review where I might give away some sort of clue as to the ending of the game, I'll give a spoiler alert. Well, in this game, I'm just going to give you a crappy footage alert. That's an interesting sound effect for that. Uh, but seriously, I'm terrible at this game and most platformers, as you know if you watch this show. But that doesn't stop me from enjoying and appreciating a good platformer like this. In fact, I played Sonic a lot more when I was a kid. And the whole thing with Sonic the Hedgehog is level memorization. The game really rewards you for taking the time to explore the levels and developing the best path through them, collecting the most rings, destroying enemies, and still getting a good time. They're brilliant, colorful, likable games that have a lot of depth and replayability, and I think a lot of people, including myself, are disappointed that Sega got away from this. In a way, Sega has positioned Sonic to be his own reality TV star. He's famous for the sake of being famous. Now he can drive carts, play sports, adventure, and he's even had his own TV show. This level reminds me of Altered Beast. But let's not forget the days when Sonic had to compete against Mario in the fierce, bitter, 16-bit rivalry the Sega Genesis versus the Super Nintendo. If you think today's console wars are bad, revisit 1992. We used whips and chains back then to settle our disputes. You know, in Streets of Rage. These days, even though Sonic may have sold out and is reportedly engaged to Lara Croft, you still have to respect his heritage and the fact that Sega makes him extremely accessible. Oh, no, I missed the thing. Sure, you can pick this game up for the Sega Genesis used for pennies, it's readily available, or you can just pick up one of the awesome Sonic collections. If you have a PlayStation 2, 3, Wii, Xbox, or PC, you can find pretty much all the Sonic games for a good price. Sonic is even on the iPad, but has he ever been as good as he was on the Sega Genesis, back when he first reared his blue head and waggling finger in 16 bits? I should admit that I am the world's worst Sonic the Hedgehog player. I may be worse at Sonic than Mario games. Two great games to be bad at. Yes, I'm terrible at the game, but I love the level design, the colorful visuals, and the music is simply incredible. Well, at least he didn't drown that time. I think the music sounds a lot like Revenge of Shinobi, but they are not the same composer. This game was done by Masato Nakamura, who also composed music for the first Sonic the Hedgehog game. The 
The Sega Genesis, when used properly, can deliver amazing sounds and music. As demonstrated here in the best part about revisiting the console war from the early 90s is that the Genesis and Super Nintendo were two completely different game systems. I'll recommend it. I think the best way to get this game is in Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, which can be found for PS3, 360, and PC. Or just pick it up used, it's a fabulous game and an important piece of Sonic the Hedgehog history. Just try not to drown him, it could leave you emotionally scarred for the rest of your life. Oh, Sonic, not again! Ah, I feel so bad about drowning him. Again! Can you see my sad face? Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. I'm smiling because I'm using the game genie. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of this miracle of science and technology. It's more than magic, it's the Game Genie for your Sega Genesis. Enjoy. The Game Genie was originally released in 1990 for the Nintendo Entertainment System from Codemasters and Galoob. This is the Game Genie for the Sega Genesis. It's a self-proclaimed video game enhancer that allows you to enter codes and modify your video game experience on the Sega Genesis. That's right, is Truxton too hard for you? Then why not enter a cheat code and give yourself unlimited bombs, unlimited ships? In many games you could choose what level to start at. It's like a genie inside your Sega Genesis that doesn't grant infinite wishes. In order to use the Game Genie, we're going to need a few things. Number one, a Sega hat because it's cool. Number two, some kind of a phone or tablet or computer connected to the internet, maybe a Sega Dreamcast. So we can search for Game Genie codes and I googled Truxton Game Genie codes, pulled up GameGenie.com. Here's a whole bunch of codes. So let's go with infinite ships, ATLT, AA6T. ATLT, so close to ATAT. A T L T A A 6 T. Start. Now I have infinite ships in Truxton, which is a tough game, so this is good for practice or just cheating. I don't even have to shoot the enemies, I'm just gonna crash into them. Come on! Come on! Woo! Infinite ships. Doesn't matter. When this thing was new, it would have come with a booklet filled with codes for various games, and I think you could even subscribe for more codes. These days, of course, you can just use the magic miracle of the internet and quickly search for a game like Truxton Game Genie Codes. It comes right up on GameGenie.com. How about Vector Man? Yes, he's on Game Genie too. All right, let's do Vector Man Invincible. A L eight A A A seven two. If you want to know if your favorite game has Game Genie codes, just check the internet. It's just that easy. While this isn't the most exciting accessory to film, I like how it stacks into a tower of power on top of your Sega Genesis. The green light lets you know that Game Genie is functioning. Inserting games into the Game Genie is pretty simple. You'll want to make sure all of the connections are clean. <laughs> Wait, I'm invincible! I have unlimited bombs. And while this doesn't work with all games, it does work with a lot of games. And I think it's a pretty neat device, actually. It's great for messing around with some Genesis games or practicing certain levels. The Game Genie won't set you back a whole lot. It's a pretty cheap device to pick up these days and the internet makes it super easy to use. You can't hurt me because I'm invincible. 
Entering codes couldn't be easier, just find what you're looking for online, use the Genesis controller to enter them, you can even stack multiple codes together. How about starting on level 8? Invincible! Multiple bombs! Unlimited health! The Game Genie makes every game easy, unless the game is impossible. You gotta respect these games that are hard, even when you're cheating with the Game Genie. You can buy Game Genies for numerous game systems, including the NES, for which it's probably best known. I love that it comes with a security strap, so you can pull it out of your Nintendo. I haven't even tried the NES one yet, but the Genesis one works great. Oh, come on. This is a great way to mess around with your collection of Genesis games. You can make games easier, you can make them harder, you can just play around with them and unlock stuff you've never seen before. The Game Genie can be easily found on eBay. Prices seem to vary, so be careful what you're spending. Oh no, my girlfriend's gonna be crushed! And I have a classic game room. Shout out and thank you to send to Jeremy from North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Thank you for sending the Game Genie to the show. You can also find Game Genies for the Super Nintendo, Game Boy, and even the Vectrex. I made that last one up. Because people who play Vectrex don't need to cheat. They're already winning. Welcome to class... <coughs> Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of this miracle of science and technology. It's magic. It's the Game Genie for your Sega Genesis. Enjoy. Alright, well I do not recommend doing this. I'm playing Truxton with infinite lives, infinite bombs, and five power-ups for each power-up pickup. Game's too hard for you? Use this thing. Cheat your way through. It's fun. Game Genie! You may have escaped, but I'll get you next time without cheating. Now that guy's got an awesome cackle. I need to get one like that. Ha ha ha! See, it's just not as good. This is Strider, an immensely popular side-scrolling action game for the Sega Genesis based on the 1989 arcade game from Capcom. No relation to Aragon from Lord of the Rings. You're a future ninja space assassin guy. Maybe? I don't know, I forget the plot. But your hair is awesome and you're out to kick ass in the year 2048. That's what's important. Strider is just one badass side-scrolling action game, and as I've said numerous times, these side-scrollers aren't really my favorite genre these days, but I played the hell out of this game as a kid. This one, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Revenge of Shinobi are my favorite side-scrollers from back in the day. I may be missing a few, but in any event, I'm definitely not as good as I used to be. Oh yeah, Bionic Commando, that was another one, and Blaster Master. But I used to pause this game and actually draw all of the characters from it because I loved the art design that much. Somewhere there's a sketchbook with drawings of all the bad guys in Strider. As this is an arcade game, it's actually quite easy to pick up and play, but as you might expect, difficult to master. How many, how many points do you want to get? How fast do you want to fly through the levels? Compared to some other side-scrollers, it's not even that challenging, although you can adjust the difficulty setting. The coolest thing about Strider is the style. The style is terrific. Retrospectively, looking at the gameplay, it's, it's okay. It certainly doesn't do anything wrong, but it's not like any groundbreaking kind of side-scrolling adventure game. It's just a very good one. 
And Strider is one of the most memorable early releases on the Sega Genesis. This is 1989 or 1990, somewhere in there. And arguably, Bionic Commando and Mega Man are better games. But Strider's just got something to it. Maybe it's his hair, or, or the name, Strider. It's, it's just a cool name for a video game. I guess that's why they used it again in Half-Life 2. Man, those things were hard. He's kind of like the Bionic Commando in a way. While he can't shoot his arm out and grab things from a distance, he does grab ledges and use his hook thing or whatever that is to climb walls, and it's an important integral part of gameplay as the Bionic Arm is in Bionic Commando. He also can't change directions in midair after he's jumped. That just ruins the realism of this game. Air battleships? Now that's believable. The inability to change directions after you've already left the ground? That's nonsense! Much of the charm in Strider is due to the audio. Everything from the music to the sound effects is quite unique, and it certainly was back in the day. The music in Strider is so different from what was normal back in the late 80s, early 90s, it seems more like a mid-70s science fiction film. It's very cinematic and almost eerie compared to the 8-bit pop tracks we're more familiar with in games like Super Mario Bros. And I love how the game messes with you at times and flips the gravity. Sometimes you're intentionally playing upside down. And this one end boss in particular is just so memorable. I know I'm suffering from nostalgia-itis while reviewing this one, but that tends to happen around here every now and then. Hey, the good news is, you can try this game out for your Genesis for just a couple bucks these days. There's a lot of them out there, they're not that hard to find. Aw, oh, now that's a shame. Strider got eaten by Piranha. I love it. Don't remember this level very well. I do like the Amazon women that throw axes at you. Oh, they're, well, they're charming. Nice girls. There is a sequel to Strider on the Genesis called Strider 2, although I don't think it's anywhere near as good as this one. And in the years following Strider's release, side-scrollers on the Genesis got bigger, better, smoother. This one definitely suffers from some frame rate and slowdown issues at times. But hey, this is Strider on the Genesis, a very nice game, and certainly one worth revisiting if you played it the first time around, and if you've never played Strider, give it a shot. Just be careful where you jump, because you might be eaten by piranha, shredded by a giant fan blade, or just happen to float off into space. Strider. Most of us are occasionally guilty of liking bad games because they're good, but then there's games that are bad, and not the good kind of bad, the bad kind of bad. Like, that's a bad game. No, that's a bad game. And this, this is a truly awful game. Partly because it starts out so promising, with a wonderful storyline and such cheesy potential. I so wanted this to be the next Cosmic Carnage, but it, it's, it's not even close. You can't even speak the names of these two games in the same breath. It would, it would be like crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. You'll be struck down by lightning. You literally have to cleanse your breath. You have to take a breath, speak something like Fighting Masters is, is terrible, and then uh, exhale, whew, inhale again, 
say something completely different, like, hey, I like pancakes, then exhale, whew, inhale again, then say, Cosmic Carnage for the 32X rocks, then exhale, whew, inhale, and apologize. I'm sorry. But it starts off so good! The music is awesome, the storyline is awesome, the graphics and artwork are awesome. Where does it all go wrong? Right about here, this this part of the game, the part where you're actually playing it. This, this is where it all goes wrong. And uh, not to say that it's unplayable, it's not. It's just there's there's no offensive or defensive strategy in Fighting Masters whatsoever. Fighting Masters is from 1992, and when you think about the early 90s and fighting games, they usually wanted to be like Street Fighter 2 or Mortal Kombat and emulate those popular games. Fighting Masters doesn't emulate anything. This game could have taken remarkable inspiration from Pit Fighter. It's so cheesy that I want to like it, but I don't. And if you play this game, I think you'll feel the same way. You'll wish that Fighting Masters had tried to copy something else. For starters, this game basically only uses two buttons on the three-button Genesis controller. I don't have the instruction manual, but if the A button does anything, I don't know what the hell it does. Maybe it calls for help. And I'm serious, maybe it sends out a signal, like there's somebody from Traco on their way to my house right now to offer an apology. In which case, I'll slap them. Do not raise my hopes by offering playable characters such as a gold brick, fire-breathing dragons, and chicks in metal bikinis, and then let me down with sloppy controls. This is like getting engaged to your girlfriend and then forgetting her name so that she dumps you on the same night. It's that kind of disaster. That No, I haven't actually been through that, but that would suck. And let's talk about backgrounds. There's not very many of them. Three or four is all I counted. And, uh, I'll, okay, I'll understand maybe it was on a tight budget, but, you know, you could have changed the color palette. Make a red one. That's the lava level. Take one and just turn it blue. That's the ice level. Green always makes a terrific forest level. To further exacerbate the situation, that's always a fun word to use. To make matters worse. As exciting and ridiculous as these characters are, their moves are boring. And no matter who you play as, you'll always end up doing the same thing over and over again. You jump, and then attack, and then jump away. Unless they're stunned, in which case you attack again. That's it. That's all that you do in this game. And since there's no defensive strategy in this game, or offensive str or any kind of strategy, the word strategy doesn't even belong in this game. If you happen to end up standing close to your opponent, they're going to grab you no matter what and throw you. So remember, attack, jump away. Attack, jump away. Repeat until you win. And if you don't win, that's only because it's so clunky that you'll eventually just get bored before you win. Which is a shame, because it looks so bad that it could have been good. But instead it's so bad that it's just bad, <laughs> and that's the wrong kind of bad. I don't want that kind of bad, I want the good bad. The Sega Genesis catalog is full of bad games that are good, like Death Duel, Cyborg Justice, and of course the previously mentioned game which I can't speak because I haven't cleansed my breath. Well that's for the 32X, but you get my point. Fighting Masters gives the word bad a bad name. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go and set a trap for when that guy from Traco shows up. Hello, I understand that you've pressed the A button on your phone. Oh God, why am I being attacked by lions?
Hey now, is this Star Wars Rebel Assault or Jaguar XJ220 for the Sega CD? What's most remarkable about this game is how similar it is to a Jaguar. It's stylish, elegant, sophisticated, beautiful. And it stopped working after five minutes. Now, to be fair, it's a 1993 release on the Sega CD, but the last time I sat in a Jaguar, the check engine light went on as I shut the door. But it was such a good-looking, sophisticated car, and I find that carried through all of the menu screens in this game, like the elegant cat gracefully walking over the items on the Jaguar which have broken and need to be fixed. Who's gonna pay for that? Well, if you could afford a Jaguar XJ220, it didn't matter. That's a tough car. The XJ220 was Jaguar's answer to the Ferrari F40 and Porsche 959. Frankly, I'm surprised to see that it got its own game. And after a trip to the mechanic and tapping on the Sega CD player a few times, I got the game working again. It's very playable and responsive on the Sega CD and has a certain Jaguar-style elegance to it, but suffers from some flaws which prevent it from being great. Most notably, my biggest disappointment is in the track design. They're, they're just flat-out boring. It generally plays very well, and it looks good, it runs smoothly, but when you get into some of the sharp corners, it's as if the game needs analog controls, because if you break too much, you'll just stop. If you break too little, you'll run into the wall, and there's like no in-between. Probably the best way to play the game is to break really early and then sort of uh, flutter the pedal, <laughs> the button on your Genesis controller, hit it repeatedly uh, until the Jaguar starts leaking something and explodes. To say the game feels like it was inspired by Sega's arcade classic OutRun is a bit of an understatement. The XJ220 comes with a CD player, unlike the crappy 8-track in that OutRun Ferrari. But that's where the Jaguar domination ends, because the game is so mediocre compared to OutRun. And even if it generally plays well and looks nice, it's kind of boring. Even though there's a variety of different background designs and courses that take place all over the world, Jaguar XJ220 lacks a sense of excitement that is found in other old-school driving games like OutRun, Top Gear, Rad Racer, Super Monaco GP, and even Test Drive 2, The Duel. There's, there's just something missing, but don't underestimate how remarkably smooth it is for a 16-bit game. Technically, it's very solid and very playable. I like that you can even save your game if you're in the championship mode. Seriously, you can turn off your Genesis and come back later and just continue playing after you load your game. No passwords or anything. It's the future! It also has a track editor and Jaguar XJ220 looks nice too. It's a good looking game. There's no other car licenses, so all of the other cars that you'll be racing against are fictional. They're not based upon any other real-life cars, though. Not that I can tell. The Ferino. What, what is that? That looks kind of like a Buick Roadmaster. Seriously, they, they should have just called these cars like the Lamborghini or Porsche Audi. Except for this one. I like the Rooster Head logo. I want that car. I think if you had this game when it was new, back in 1993, it would have been awesome. But in a way, it raises the bar too high and makes me expect more from it. No. It's playable, it looks nice, it's got cool cars in it. It saves games, it has a track editor, championship mode, but something about it just really isn't all that exciting. Odds are, if you're collecting games like this, you're not pinching your pennies anyway, but if you are, I would steer you towards OutRun, Rad Racer, or Top Gear. Jaguar XJ220, unlike the real car, does not cost very much these days to buy. I have to thank Frank in California for the donation, thank you again. 
At this point, Jaguar XJ220 is either for those who remember the game way back in the day and want to relive the experience, or for those collecting driving games on the Sega CD. It's not bad, but it's not as good as it could be either. Now this is a fancy car, so uh, you know I was hoping it would do some cool things like run over bystanders watching the race. Which, sadly, it doesn't do, but check this out. All of these people are making out in the trailers while watching auto racing. Incidentally, they're all wearing the exact same clothes, too. Kind of creepy. This is Thunder Force 2 for the Sega Genesis. And right away you can see the difference between this game and Thunder Force 3. This game holds a special place in my heart because this is the first Genesis game other than Altered Beast, which came with my Sega Genesis when I bought it. This is the first Genesis game that I ever got. As you heard in the beginning, I love the dialogue when you pick up special weapons, and I have no idea what she's saying when you pick up your shield. So if anyone knows what the hell she's saying, let me know, because I've always been curious about that. Thunder Force 2 is from Technosoft, the same great company that brought us Thunder Force 3, and also the amazing Herzog's Y, one of my favorite games of all time. And interestingly enough, this game shares a lot of the same sound effects uh, with Herzog's Y and you can hear those throughout. So I wonder if they had the same design team or a lot of the same designers working on these two games simultaneously. Thunder Force 2 seems like it was a lot of great ideas put together pretty quickly. It's not nearly as well put together as Thunder Force 3. It's just a much rougher game than Thunder Force 3. You notice the background designs are not nearly as rich and detailed as they are in Thunder Force 3, or even Thunder Force 4, Lightning Force. Everything seems much more two-dimensional. But it's a very unique game for the Genesis, and it's a unique game in general, and a lot of fun to play because of the combination of that overhead shooting mode and the horizontal shooting mode. And this game does have the Hunter weapon, which is one of my favorite weapons from Thunder Force 3. In conclusion, it's obviously an earlier Genesis game. They got much more advanced in the years after this, if you like Thunder Force 3, 
and Gradius and Raiden and those kind of games, you'll love this. Although I personally prefer Thunder Force 3, this game is probably, in some respects, more challenging. Uh, especially if you want to actually just get through the whole game and win it, and also uh, go for points. It has a lot of enemies to shoot on the vertical overhead shooting levels that you have to go out and find, and or you can just run through the levels really fast. And on the horizontal levels, especially later in the game, they get very, very difficult. If you're a fan of the Genesis and of shooting games, this is one that you definitely have to pick up. And you can check out the Classic Game Room HD review of Thunder Force 3 to see the comparison between these two games. Wake up, Hicks! Sit here on this level and listen to the music. It's so good. Commander Darius! <laughs> I get it. Yes, more things in life need to remind me of aliens mixed with Smash TV. This is what the world needs. Xeno Crisis on the Sega Genesis. This is a 2019 release from Bitmap Bureau also available on other game systems, lesser game systems. But I think the proper way to play this is on the Sega Genesis, and you're gonna want a six-button controller. Don't even think of playing this game with the three-button controller. It just, it just won't work well. The D-pad controls the direction of your Space Marine. Four of the buttons direct your fire. One of the buttons rolls, and the other one throws grenades. If you like Smash TV, you're gonna love Xeno Crisis. The only crisis I see is that we don't have more of these games. Where's this sequel? Is it Lieutenant Truxton? Unsurprisingly, I love the art design, heavily inspired by some movie that we've probably seen a couple times. Maybe a few movies. The chunky 16-bit graphical presentation harnesses all of the properties of blast processing that the universe can throw onto your CRT without exploding the screen. Xeno Crisis does it right. Provided you have a six-button Sega Genesis controller with which to play the game. The controls are the hardest part, like a twin-stick shooter, such as games like Robotron 2084 and Smash TV. You need to, like, run and shoot at the same time. And my brain kept wanting to go back to a twin-stick configuration, but the D-pad and buttons will have to suffice. On the three-button controller, you need to rotate, and it's just, trust me, don't even try. 
as one would expect, wave after wave of increasingly difficult enemies will attack, swarm, and try to consume your space marine. And a variety of vivid alien worlds and horrible laboratories. They try to eat your face, they try to shoot you, they try to explode. But you won't let them because you're a space marine fueled by the power of blast processing in the future. Absolute badass. In between missions, you'll exchange those dog tags that you've collected for upgrades. Don't forget to upgrade, you won't get very far in Xenocrisis without upgrading. You can also purchase continues, and you'll definitely want those. This game isn't easy, even on easy. Xenocrisis packs a punch. Repeat gameplay and mastery of the controls is a must, but the game looks, plays, and sounds so good, that won't be a problem. You could play other games, but you could also be an idiot. Spend that time with Xenocrisis, why not? My knockoff GoPro doesn't do the sound justice. I'll show you something at the end of the video. If uh, you're one of those sad, unfortunate people without a Sega Genesis, I mean, I I'm, I'm sorry. If they've been out since 1989, you've had plenty of time to get one. You can also play this on a plastic piece of junk like the Nintendo Switch, but I think that increases the chance that you'll be skull bombed by Lightning God Truxton at some point in the future, so I really can't recommend it. Sega Genesis all the way. Maybe Steam, but you know, keep that one a secret. It's also on the Evercade, which is acceptable because the Evercade harnesses the power of Truxton. It's like a shield against stupidity and incompetence. If it plays Truxton, you must own it. Wait, that's the Vectrex. Well, you need to own that too. I'm just bankrupting you. My apologies. It's a relatively short game, so if you're really good at it, I guess you can blast your way through it and then want more. The hard difficulty is merciless, as if easy wasn't hard enough. Provided you have two Genesis controllers, you can invite a friend and play Xenocrisis together. Perhaps reducing the chance that you'll be eaten by an alien and slowly digested over a period of a thousand years. I love the storyline that unfolds through slides in between each level, and the variety of enemies and end bosses is pretty cool. Also, you gotta pay respect to the voice dialogue in Xenocrisis. More Genesis games should talk to you. Just imagine what they would say. Did you hear that? That's weird. I don't remember even putting that in the edit. Not sure where it came from. But I know where this game came from. From my friend Lee in North Carolina. Thank you, Lee. The show doesn't take game donations anymore, but Lee's been in touch over the years, and I couldn't resist playing another new, say new, new-ish, new-ish 21st century, 25th century Sega Genesis game. Xenocrisis is tons of fun and totally worth playing on whatever game system you have. Honestly, it's true. No, really. Every game system is acceptable. Provided, provided it's not, it's not Nintendo. Nintendo. Where's that coming from? I'm not doing that, I swear. <laughs>